Dumela Saubona Sakpase Namaste Upshin Dukra Otra Assalamu alaikum and Hotep. Buenas noches, bonsoir. What is going on? It brings me great pleasure, and I mean great pleasure, to welcome you to tonight's broadcast. It is not only season four, episode six, but it is also not the usual day that I stream. Why? Because the guest that is going to be on the digital couch tonight had another, you know, opportunity to chat. And I don't mind taking second seat to one of the a really, really great, great live streamer and show host. You'll find out who that is. Tonight, I have the esteemed pleasure to welcome to my show here tonight, Dr. Julian Malvo. You know her as the President Emerita of Bennett College for Women. You know her as the economist, the author, the commentator, whose popular writings have appeared in USA Today, Black Issues in Higher Education, Ms. Magazine, Essence Magazine, The Progressive, and many more. Well known for appearances on national network programs, including CNN, BET, PBS, NBC, ABC, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and others. She is always booked for commentary on such subjects ranging from economics, women's rights, public policy, and she's also hosted television and radio programs. She is a committed activist. We're going to talk about all that tonight. And a civic leader, Dr. Malvo, has held positions in women's civil rights and policy organizations, currently serving on the board of the Economic Policy Institute, the Recreation Wishlist Community of Washington, D.C., the, and the Liberian Education Trust. Malvo is also the president of Push Excel, the educational branch of branch of the Rainbow Push Coalition. I want to give you just another little piece of info. I had the blessed opportunity to be at her side a couple of weeks ago. And so we're going to talk about all of that and then some. Please welcome Dr. Julian Malvo. Hey, Doriel. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Um, I think it's wonderful that our people are doing more and more to get information out. So thank you for being part of that continuum. That includes, of course, my Monday, regular Monday appearances at Roland Martin Unfiltered. And I think that Roland is a darn genius. Uh, he had trouble at ABC. He had trouble at CNN. He said, heck, I'm going to go do my own thing. And more and more of us really need to do that. So he is uh, streamed um, on YouTube and other. Uh, well, actually, his network is called the Black Star Network. Right. And so he has his own network, which has many, many of our people. Uh, doing weekly shows and some doing daily shows. And um, he, he, like I said, I think I give the brother mad props for inventing, creating his own platform, inventing it, finding funding, um, getting sponsors, just doing the whole thing. And that is why we are here on the Doria Larry show, where I invite influential people to come and chat about the impact that they make for people to live live their lives better. And you, Dr. Malvo, you take the cake. You take the cake. <laughs> so we are going to have a beautiful conversation tonight. And I want to just give a little, uh, a little, you know, housekeeping uh, for those of you who know. Uh, so I need two things. First of all, Dr. J and I both have our cups because this is going to be, you know, a little bit of tea time. We, I also need my stream team to come on in and, of course, take notes, drop comments, ask questions. I know we're going to be streaming from a couple of different platforms on YouTube and on Facebook. And so I'm going to be looking. You may see my eyes dart from side to side. It's just that I'm looking for the comments in order to bring questions. And we do have some family members from a couple of different organizations. So first and foremost, shout out to NCNW, the National Council of Negro Women headquarters, NCNW Strong, Purple Power. I do have my pin on, because so I will be wearing that little beautiful hat, and we'll talk about the hat in a moment. I'm also going to be representing, of course, my own show, but also, you and I had spent an amazing, amazing uh, conversation in a couple of days over the seas, across the water, on the water, and so we're going to talk about that as well, and so also a shout out to the Happy Family, and if you were there, you understand why I said that. So in order, <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. we'll talk about that. So in order, I first, of course, want to give recognition and thanks and uh, blessings and to speak her name for 
our former past president of the National Council of Negro Women, and that would be to Sister uh, and Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, who again is uh, past president of the National Council of Negro Women. And so I want to take the first opportunity to, to speak her name. Uh, her birthday is coming up in a few days. And so part of my trifecta this evening is to pay homage to her. And you said that uh, you you have some uh, interesting stories. And so I definitely want to, uh, so NCNW across the country is actually celebrating her birthday, sort of all during this month, but her birthday is in a few days. So I wanted to take an opportunity to um, for you to share reflections on the work that you have done in, in civil rights and social justice, uh, standing up for, of course, women and families, and uh, leading the charge at speaking out for issues that affect, again, women and families in our communities. And if you have a vignette or a little little story about Dr. Hyde, please bless us with it. Well, first of all, of course, we know that she was an icon. I hope everyone has read her book, Open Wide the Freedom Gates, which is a book that was written several years ago, but it's still very relevant. It's her autobiography, really. And I had always uh, pushed her, but she didn't have time. But she knew everybody. So I said to her, you need to do like just a dictionary of the people you knew. Put them in alphabetical order. You know, Roosevelt, FDR, Eleanor Roosevelt. She did, she knew every president um, through President Obama who did her eulogy at her funeral. Um, she just, um, and, she, and she was such a lady, came until her, maybe about a year before she made her transition, came to the walk office every day with her hat and gloves on. I mean, she was a lady uh, to the bone, but that, that, that doesn't mean she was a sucker. It just means that she was a lady. She knew how to tell, get people told quite nicely. She knew how to, uh, and she knew how to get people moving. I, she used to crack me up because she might call you at six in the morning and she'd say, Miss Malvo, I need X, 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 click. So you had no time to say yes, no, or maybe so. She had given the order and she just assumed that you were going to follow it up. If you happened to call her back, she said, was I misunderstood? And <laughs> that meant you have the assignment, do it. So one of the things that I did with her, there was a book that um, NCNW released upon the opening of the building on Pennsylvania Avenue. It was called The Voices of Vision, African-American Women on the Issues. And I believe it was Time uh, Magazine or Time, not Time Mag, Time Inc. that underwrote the production of the book. Now I have to tell you, it was an arduous task for which I did not get paid. But that's you never got paid with Dr. Height. I mean, you got you might get some tickets to something, but you were not going to get paid. Uh, and um, it was very hard work, and we did it. Now, however, Dr. Height is very so st strong-willed, as am I. And so we basically tussled a bit about who should be authors in the book, which probably has it's upstairs somewhere, probably about 20 chapters. And we let, dealt with many aspects of African-American women's um, lives. And at some point, I she put somebody in, I take them out. I put somebody in, she take them out. And one day I said, Dr. Hyde, if we don't get on the same page, you're not going to get a book. You're going to have a pamphlet. <laughs> wait, wait, what's the what's the title? Voices? Voices of Vision, African American Women on the Issues. It's likely out of print because it was done probably 20 years ago. Uh and it was basically they've sold it out of headquarters and gave it away for a point in time. I think I probably have five or six copies up in my um office. But um had Lottie Dottie and everybody in there uh quoting, writing chapters. Uh, one of our great compromises is there were three sisters who had submitted chapters and they were all too long. And she said she didn't want to uh, offend any of them. So I had to hire an editor to meld their chapters because they were writing about education and then to um, give them triple credit. Um, so we did, it, it, it was work, but I learned, I always learned a lot from her. Not that I necessarily, um, <laughs> inculcated all of the lessons, but I always did learn a lot from her. She was amazing. She, we had a, a Dorothy Hyde scholarship when I was president at Bennett, which she allowed us to do. It was one of the first Hyde scholarships and it went to um, a young lady who had exhibited leadership uh, abilities as a high school student. 
Uh, she came down to my installation. She came down to bed it twice for me, first for my installation and then for another event that we did. And she was she was always just very gracious and kind. And as you know, she had our groupies because NCNW is an international organization. And uh, the sisters were always there for pictures and everything. And she never told anybody, no, you had to tell them no. I'll tell you one funny story. We went to some event. I think the Joint Center for P Political and Economic Studies had one of their dinners, and they had it at the Washington Hilton, one of those Hiltons. And anyway, it, you know, Black people dinners, we got to stop that. But um, it went longer than it should have. I mean, it had a reception beforehand. Oh, we had to eat and chat. Yeah, well, um, and, and if you're in a hotel that's a union hotel, you will pay for the eating and the chatting if you go past the appropriate time. So there was the din there was a reception, there was a dinner, which went very long. It went so long that uh, Bill Lucy, who was the head of the, um, one of the unions um, and the head of the coalition of black trade unionists gave the clo uh, closing prayer and said, thank you, Lord, that the dinner did not last until the next day. You know, uh, pe people often say, let's make sure the dinner ends today because if it started at eight and people got chatty and you know you have preachers who are mad that they didn't get to give the keynote speech so their prayer became a keynote speech um they would pray, they'd have blessed the <laughs> table and the chairs and the forks and you know put their commentary in there so anyway it's probably 11 o'clock and a bunch of us were, were hanging with dr height there were a group of us we called ourselves the height s because we hung with dr height I and love uh, and would be with her here and there, Vanessa Weaver, uh, of course, Alexis, who was like her daughter, uh, Cora Berry, so many others. Hi, Dad. So we would be with her. So she, we thought she was ready to go because it's 11 o'clock. I was ready to go. Um, and I said, okay, Dr. Hi, thanks a lot. She said, oh, no, 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 no. We have to go to the after party. I said, the after party? She said, the brother Wait, is having- Dr. Hi was hanging at the after party? Yeah, it was, it was it was not an after party, after party, like people dancing. It was some guy, guy the brother who was the head of the joint center at the time, had some, um, you know, snacks and drinks in his suite. But I said, Dr. Hyde, I'm tired. She said, I'm not. Well, now, when a little old lady tells you they're not tired, that's called put your smile on and keep it moving. Keep it moving. You better be there. You better be right by my side or behind me. We're going to be exactly. doing this together. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So of course I'm going to have to uh, send this out. So I must make two uh, notifications, actually three notifications. First, I have to give uh, pay homage and thanks to NCNW Flappers, National Council of Negro Women Flappers section of which I am the president, president currently. Thank you very much, ladies and sisters, for electing me as the president. Number two, to my convener, Sister Johnny Walker, who is the New York State convener. And of course, I could not I would be remiss if I did not pay homage and take a moment to our current national president, which is Reverend Dr. Siobhan Arline Bradley. Thank you, Dr. Arline Bradley. Terrific. For she, she's terrific. I was just with her uh, last week, uh, Friday, at Melanie Campbell's conference uh, uh, around the National Coalition of Civic uh, Participation and the Black Women's Roundtable. And they had their conference Wednesday through Friday. I went up Friday Wednesday through, Wednesday through Friday, maybe it was Wednesday through Sunday, but I only went on Friday to participate in a panel about economic development. But um, so I just saw Siobhan and she is terrific. She's a very worthy um, successor of Dr. Height for so many reasons, her religious background, her public policy grounding. And of course, the fact that she is of the younger generation, which I think is really important. I don't know if she's 50, but if she's 50, she's just 50. And as, as you know, for a very long time with NCNW, we had elder leadership. And while on one hand, all those elders deserved their positions and executed them well, on the other hand, if you want to have an inclusive organization, it has to be interdisciplinary. And I think Siobhan, she's a mom, she's the cutest little boy. Um, you know, she's a has a leadership role in her church. She's modeling what young women can be, you know, in terms of, I won't say you have it all because you're never going to have it all, but that you can juggle roles, be a leader, be a mom, you know, be a wife, all of that. And, and she does it with such gentility. So 
it, she she's a winner. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. I I, I don't think I can go to my next meeting with without having said that. So to all my NCNW sisters out there, Purple Power, NCNW Strong, NCNW All Day. And so I just, I wanted to, of course, start off with that. And thank you for sharing the vignette about, uh, yes, Dr. Dorothy Hyde, just picking up the phone. And I, I've heard stories just like that. So I'm not asking you. And the church will always say, I'm voluntolding you. Mm -hmm. you know? I picked your name. No, sorry, because you might want to talk. You might want to talk about these type. Da 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 da. -da. Click. <laughs> <laughs> I know a couple of other people who adopted probably that same strategy. And if y'all in NCNW, you know what I mean. But it's great work. It's great leadership, and and we are doing our part. The key is we're doing our part. And, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. That's well, what. Def yes, ma'am. <coughs> founded in 1935 is one of our historic organizations. And those historic organizations are very important. And I think that Janice Mathis, who preceded us, uh, Siobhan, did a lot of work to expand our youth and college uh, sections, um, really traveling. And D Janice is back in the leadership. She uh, passed the baton and thought she was going to retire. But I think she had one of those Dr. High conversations with Siobhan. And the next thing you <laughs> She's back. She's back in the office. Here we go. Right. <laughs> Precisely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see my NCNW sister, NCNW strong. Uh, Tina, you know, we got to do next. Let's make sure we, we get uh, you know our, our leadership onto this call as well. Uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, so I do want, and of course, people, I'm trying to look at the comments all of where this is being shared. Uh, I would like to shift to how the work of, let's say, NCNW has, and one of the foci, what our core four, let me state our, our core four, which I have just sort of made an acronym of SHE, right? So that would be social responsibility, social justice. For the SH would be the health initiative, mind, mm -hmm. body, and soul, making sure that we are well in all of the aspects of our being. Uh, the first E being economic economics and entrepreneurship, and then the last, not necessarily in that order, is education. Right. And so the she, our core four, um, I'd like to shift into one of your buckets of, of conversation that has to do with economics. And so a few weeks ago, we had the blessed opportunity to spend some time on the, on the Hopi River. Let's call it what it is, on the yeah. Hopi River uh, across the waters. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Daryl. I appreciate you. Yes, this is going to be awesome. Please ask questions. I think you said you wanted to ask some questions, so drop them now. And um, so we had an opportunity to, to spend some time and um, engage in conversation about economics. And so because this is still Women's History Month, the yes. question I have for you is, given the economics of today, whether it be housing issues or job security slash insecurity slash we don't really know what's happening. If it is coming out of, as I will call it, Ronaville and, you know, the Rona Wars and yes. uh, how it has shifted the narrative of where we work, how we work, how secure our employment opportunities are, how does entrepreneurship add itself to the plate of what women should look forward to. Hmm. So that's, do we, do we stick with just the, you know, get your education and get the nine to five or should you add on the nine to five and then five to nine? How does well, that look today? You know, it's interesting. Um, as you say, Ronaville, uh, the virus pushed a lot of people to reevaluate where they were what their goals and aspirations were. Many people were freed up when their job says you're working from home, they decided or discovered they liked the job that much. They discovered that they spent a lot of time and money commuting and not only commuting, but uh, maintaining that wardrobe and the look. And when you were working from home, although I know some melanin deficient people who got, um, laser what that Botox surgery because they were on the screen too much and they thought, well, I see the lines on my head. Yeah, because you old fool. That's why you have lines on your head. Just let it go. 
Um, but in any case, many of us found new ways to work, new ways. I had one group of young women that I truly and deeply admire. They're all young attorneys, 40-ish, and they have um, children. And with COVID, they found that they um, did, their kids were being doing school online and it wasn't perfect. So the group of them, it's three or four of them, four or five of them, I think, they hired a teacher to homeschool their children. They paid the woman what she would have made in the D.C. public schools. They paid her taxes and into her retirement account. I mean, they were, like I said, they were young attorneys. They could afford it, uh, mostly with working husbands, so they could afford it. But their children did not fall behind. And, you know, I think that it, you've, you're finding people becoming more creative about what they do and how they do it. So that's exciting. You also found what we uh, began to experience in 2000, 2021, what we call the great resignation. People just said, mm, I don't need this. Um, some employers just very um, abruptly in 2023 said, y'all got to come back to work and sit at your desk. And a whole lot of people said, you know, you can take this job and shove it. I am not coming back to sit at my desk. And they figured out other ways, whether it's consulting, um, you know, starting their own business, um, spending more time with family, which is also extremely important. You know, I want to shout out uh, HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge, who is a soror, of course, uh, as Dr. Height was, as I am, of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. But also she, um, you know, she was a avid member of NTNW, and uh, nice say was, is. And Secretary Fudge, her last day will be the 22nd of March. And she said she, um, first of all, you can't pass anything in this Congress, not even gas. I mean, that's literally how um, turgid this Congress is. So she said, I'm not going to get a lot more done. But secondly, she wants to spend more time with her 92-year-old mother. Um, nothing wrong with mom. She just wants to enjoy her and soak up that wisdom while she can. And I think that one of the things, um, for those who could afford it, and I want to speak to that for a minute, but for, the, for people re-examine family ties. I know that my family has become closer, uh, is more into checking in. If I don't call one of my sisters every other day, she's like, are you alive? Uh, yeah, fool, I'm just working. But, uh, <laughs> And we need that, that <laughs> but, but but we 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 rebonded in ways that we hadn't before, and I think a lot of people discovered that during COVID as well. And all of us miss the in-person time that we used to have, our receptions, our events. We're mm -hmm. doing, we're becoming back to that. But for a long time, we did. We had sorority meeting on Zoom. Uh, to me, that is not sorority meeting, uh, yeah. but it's it's often the best you could do. My church worshipped on Zoom for you know, two years. Um, and we just, when we go to worship, I mean, it, it's a blessing and a curse because I think Sunday, I, well, I partied this weekend, which I don't often do, but I was out every day, end day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so um, I put my clothes out to go to church on Sunday and I woke up and I was like, uh, let me roll back over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so were you a bedside Baptist? A bedside metropolitan AME. Okay, okay, metropolitan. She you, at least she told you where she was. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I I am a part of the morning meditation ministry. They know that I'm there, but you know, some some the Zoom has given us the option of rolling over and watching the service on the computer. Um, and, it, right. and it, I I actually did a meditation some weeks ago, which I said, you know, it's it's convenient, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. the, the human connection is something. But I want to go back to something I said earlier about people who could shove their job. Everybody can't shove their job. We really do to, need to look and pay more attention to class differences in our community. I mean, when we look at um, the bus driver who the white lady uh, coughed on and then he died of COVID. He was out of Detroit, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have an opportunity. You, you can't drive a bus remotely. So he didn't have the opportunity to stay at home. All those grocery workers that we called essential, but we did not give them essential pay. Mm. So to stock those grocery shelves. That's they right, but we needed to eat. Staying home. The nurses um, couldn't stay home. Many teachers were able to. You know, the 
typical jobs for black women. It's changed some, but still teacher, nurse, social worker. Try to provide social work services remotely. You can do it, but it's not the same and a whole lot gets hidden. Even counseling services. I know that I was at Cal State LA and they were talking about attempting to do more counseling online. And a lot of, especially men of color, they weren't going to counseling anyway, but they certainly weren't going online. It just did not meet their needs. So we really have to be, I mean, COVID raised an awareness in ways that I found very interesting. But one of the awarenesses that it raised, although we didn't follow up on it, was the issue of class. We don't all have the same options and we need to talk about that when we talk about uh, what's going on. I mean, because, you know, want to talk economics, let's talk inflation. If you earn 100000 a year or more, which is not a lot of money contextually, but on the other hand, it is contextually because the average income overall is about 65000 And for a Black household, it's about 55000 So that's, again, if you're thinking about a major city, D.C., New York, that's, that's not a lot of money. Right. But in any case... If you make the hundred to a closet, you know, if, if, if you make if you make a, if you make six figures, inflation is not kicking your butt. You notice inflation. You know, you went to the store and you bought something and a, a month later it's five or ten cents more. You, you about, wait, wait, wait. How about them eggs months ago? Although I don't oh, buy eggs. But that, yeah, eggs. Eggs, is, eggs is an affordable protein staple and the price of eggs, eggs nearly doubled. So, you know, at the top, inflation is an annoyance. I mm -hmm. went to some store and I, something, I, well, I forgot what it was. So I, I, oh, it was my peanut butter pretzels that I always buy. I had them in, I had them in Egypt. Uh, the, yep, <laughs> I remember. Yeah, and my peanut butter pretzels, they were like three fifty nine, dollars and they went up to four twenty nine, dollars and I'm like, it was the same pretzels. It's and so the I, same. <laughs> I just put the suckers back because I'm not addicted to peanut butter pretzels pretzels. And it wasn't, again, the extra 70 cents was not going to make or break me. I could afford it. It just annoyed me. Right. It right. annoyed me. Whereas for somebody else, they might say, can't afford it. And so just, just um, in the past three months, gas prices have gone back up. They had gone down to a nice number, uh, three, I forgot, but now Man, they're back three, to about three or so. Yeah. Now the average national is $3 and 43 cents. And that's per gallon. And that's 40 cents more than it was in January. Now, again, for somebody who, um, you know, is living their life like it's golden, 40 cents a gallon isn't going to make or break you. If you need that car to get to your job and your job is across town, you basically have experienced a 10% increase in the mm -hmm. cost of gas. And that mm -hmm. could make or break you. You are, or you start rationing your trips and doing that kind of thing. So President Biden, I think, has done a very good job on the economy, but that's at the top. How much of that good job has trickled down? And the reason that you're seeing so many people who are angry, people who are saying, I can't vote for him, is because the economic gains have not trickled down. Now, I'm, I'm going to give him do where do is do. I mean, and he does deserve a lot of credit. But again, the, but he is of a generation that has a tendency to be very modest. In other words, they don't toot their own horns. Vice President Harris as well, she's doing much better at li lifting up the, the accomplishments of the administration. But we need to hear a lot more of that. We need every one of those cabinet members to hit the road and to say what has been done. Over 160, uh, I think, million of the dollars of student loan debt forgiven. Now, he couldn't forgive it all because the Supreme Court wouldn't let him. And the other thing I think a lot of us don't understand who are not in the political realm is that presidents don't get to do a whole lot unilaterally. Has to go through Congress, House and Senate. Senate generally has his back, generally not always. There's the Joe Manchins and the Kirsten Cinemas of the world. But praise the Lord, they disappear. Um, but um, the House is horribly divided. Uh, little Mike Johnson is an ineffective leader. And um, like I said, you couldn't pass gas in that Congress if you had to get a bell for it. Doriel, I don't hear you. I think you're on mute. So sorry. 
Thank you very much. I'm trying to do like three things. So on, on that note, and thank you very much for recognizing. Uh, and we did have some people who were uh, commenting. I am going to pull up a comment um, from one of our, our viewers in a moment that, um, yes, you know, the, let's I'll keep it as like the nine to five during that period of time of our global shutdown that people were forced into a corner where some people made a choice. Do I want to stay? Do I want to shift? Do I want to go? Do I want to add on? Do I want to modify my my income in order to get to whatever that next step, excuse me, get to whatever that next step is, uh, whether it be lifting yourself up, moving yourself over. Some people, like you said, if they had the income and the opportunity and the access that they could relocate. Uh, and if they had to stay put, then again, those with access and opportunity and information could sort of pull other academic support personnel in in order to make sure that their children were were afloat yeah. so the creating of um pods i think the phrase was as soon as we shut down that that word was uh launching up uh and and out through the ethos whereas some other people had already participated in educational cooperatives or homeschooling became a not just for the select few but literally it, it came or it became the probable option and only option for most of those who are educated. On that note, very shortly, those people who had less access to education prior to that, once it came to that moment where we all had to learn indoors, people who did not have access to information, who are now given immigration opportunities and coming to the country, and I'm saying that as an educator, where there is uh, an increase of new families, let's call them new families, newer families to, to the states. Uh, we're looking at a different, mm, a different level of educational gap. And those mm -hmm. people who are in education, you, you know what I'm talking about. And so the type of work that we're doing literally as of today is still spilling over, not just with our students who have been here, but student new families who are coming over and uh, we're having to try to fill in, even though they are age appropriate, the educational gaps are much larger. And so it does make the work for principals and support staff and guidance and, you know, I'll say line staff, you know, frontline teachers. It makes our work just a little bit more interesting, just a little bit. Well, the other thing is that generationally, children have changed. There used to be a reverence for teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the teacher oh, could be the most senior person in the community. Now there's almost a um, contempt for teachers. One of my sisters, who is an accomplished attorney and CPA and MBA, uh, in her kind of whatever she is, she's also kind of interesting. Uh, but she's doing substitute teaching these days. And she's mm. had... Um, with math, she, she does math, and she has had some some of the experiences that she tells me about. You know, you you you're like, oh hell no. She <laughs> had one young young lady who refused to turn her boom box off. I didn't even know they had still had boom boxes, uh, but refused to turn her boom box off because she's failing in math and she basically doesn't want to hear it. So she turns her boom box on to drown out the teacher. So my sister told her. Turn the boom box off. Mm -hmm. And the girl refused to. She said, no. And then she said, make me. So Marianne went over and just hit the button to turn it off. And the girl turned it back on. So she said, okay, I hate to do this to you, but I'm calling the principal. You, you got to go. So the girl was removed from the classroom. On the way out, she made a number of threats, very prophetic mm. threats. The next day, the girl's mama and auntie came to the school to kick my sisters behind. Now, the challenge is this. My sister is about three inches taller than me and about 100 pounds heavier than me. I don't threaten to kick her behind. <laughs> and I'm her elder because mm. it's going to turn out right. So Mariana's like, you know, I'm not going to do anything to you on school grounds, but if you're here after school, I got something for you. And <laughs> so <laughs> they did not come back. Um, she did get in trouble because they said she threatened them. She said they threatened me, but you know, you as a teacher, you have to. But this is unheard of 
30 years ago, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, even 10, you wouldn't have this. But you have children having children. You have young women. Uh, usually it's young women who they, maybe they haven't finished high school. Maybe they have finished, but they just don't have any reverence for education. And why don't they have reverence? Because education has provided them with no ROI. They have not mm -hmm. seen a return on their investment. They didn't get the job they, they were promised. Maybe they didn't go to college. Maybe they got pregnant early. Who knows what happens? But they don't have rever the kind of reverence for education that, you know, well, you know, I'm 70. So, um, but when, when I was coming up, you would not dare contradict a teacher. Not even if she wasn't your teacher. You would not dare say anything. Um, my, you know, educators run in my family. And well, I had one aunt in Moss Point, Mississippi, Annie Mae Randall. And again, you can't do what she used to do. She was a little short, fat lady, but she would karate chop the youngins. She, she, <laughs> and people would talk about she said, you got to start with Miss Randall. She'd give you a karate. Now, it couldn't have been that hard because, or, you know, that heavy, but that was her form of discipline. And people in Moss Point still remember her. She was a fifth grade teacher for generations. And so the little boys, you know, who are now grown men and beyond would say, yeah, Miss Randall had that karate chop and you would say anything. And she put that hand up like she was about to chop you. But um, but you wouldn't dare. I mean, you just wouldn't dare. And now there is absolutely no reverence, not only for teachers, but for elders or for anybody else. But, you know, speaking of elders, I want to give you a shout out. You and Sean. Y'all took care of me on that. Happy, happy, happy. Oh, we can. So you know, wait, wait, I'm, running, I'm, running, I'm running around with this cane and under doctor's orders. And y'all took good wait, care of me. Wait a minute. Wait, let me bring up. So hold on. We got we got person number one. Love and light family. <laughs> if you were not on the happy tour, you will not understand why we will say family with all these whys. So that's Tashi. Hold on. I have another person. Come on. Brother Jamar Milton, who was on my show about two weeks ago, as soon as we were getting back and we were still trying to reacclimate to the time zone. Ankin Ma'at, yes, Brother Jamar, praise, uh, excellent praise to the one most high. And then we have Brother Ryan Green, Ma'at Hope Tep family, peace, excellent. And then, of course, Brother T uh, Sister Tika, excellent. Yes, Dr. Julia Malvo was well taken care of. So, not that we intended to shift over to this right now, but we can. So we can get into our, our third segment, which is the Happy Tour by Aket Tours. So let me now shout out to Sister Felicia Hardin and Brother Taki Grant, who were fabulous at coordinating. And I'm going to drop Aket Tours in the chat so everyone has an opportunity to click on it and see if you have followed me. You have seen me do like a little photo video dump or blessing about some of my excursions, some of my shenanigans, and Dr. J was one of them. So let me just say this. And I know my mother's watching. So mama, thank you very much for telling me to go clean out this drawer. A number of years ago, and this is also a blessing to my father as well, who's left this earth uh, about 12 years ago. My father would uh, is is the father who would um, because I'm an educator. He would sort of clip out things that he thought was interesting from the the daily news, which we bought every day. And one day he clipped this um, article, and it was about uh, let's say people who were uh, it was it was thought that they were shoplifting. Who was in the picture? Dr. Julianne Malvo. He clipped it out. This was had to be 20 something years ago. He said, I think this is interesting. I put it in the, in the file drawer. That file drawer has sat in my house, in my mother's house, wherever I travel for the past 20 something years. My mother said, please go clean out this cabinet. I cleaned it out and I found two things. One was this article that had Dr. Julia Malvo's picture on it, and I will post it up in my Facebook stories in the next coming uh, upcoming days because I packed it in a suitcase and I don't know where it is. And the other one was a picture of uh, from the Museum of Natural History of the sarcophagus of King Tutankhamun. Same folder. I go to pull it out, clean out the at the cabinet, and there goes both things. And I said, "Look at God! Look at God! I'm going to yeah, be yeah. this woman." And so. Now let's talk about the Hoppy Tour. We had a ball. 
Let's yes, just we did. We yes, we did. It was glorious and amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Brother Jamar. Family, I appreciate you. Here's Sister Lori. Yes, family. <laughs> <laughs> With all those wives. And we yes. have to tell them that we had a, a our guide. You can tell them, Dr. J, because they, they'll believe you. Egyptian sister. And whenever she tried to get order, there were two buses of us, you know, so like you 80 know people order, first of all, in general, but then with all these people and she would say, okay, family. And there was a little girl who oh. she decided that she was going to be the mascot. So whatever <laughs> the guy, lady says, she said, family, it was just so cute. That young lady is, she was amazing. But the whole, you know, the whole crew, it was an amazing group of people, um, you know, who bonded and, you know, had a great time together. And like I said, I'm just grateful. I almost didn't come because I took a fall in December and I'm still somewhat recovering from it. Um, I've got dental work that has to be done because I cracked my teeth. Uh, they've been trying to figure out what happened, which they can't figure out. And I, they keep doing tests. What happened? Uh, now the conclusion is I probably had a couple of mini strokes along the mm -hmm. way. But I'm just walking down the street. I fell right in my face, busted lip, still a little busted, cracked teeth, and um, ah, da, 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 da. So I told Felicia, I said, Felicia, I don't think this is the best idea in the world, especially because my, um, my doctors, well, I had to get clearance. And both, right. but both of my doctors, my primary and my neurologist are Egyptian. And mm -hmm. uh, by coincidence, my primary I've had for Divine 25 years. Intervention. And um, the neurologist studied under her. Um, so they, they, they both are, we really want you to make this trip. So then they gave me conditions. One mm -hmm. was that I had to take the cane. You know, divas don't really like to do canes, but I, <laughs> I did the cane. And I, and you know, I have to admit, I needed that cane. I needed that cane on that ship, and I needed that cane, you know, out on the because the terrain was very uneven. So what was yes, it was. Two was I could not do the balloon ride. I don't still don't understand why, but I didn't really mind because I've done hot air balloons in Napa Valley. Over the years, I'm a native San Franciscan, so the Don't only only let that happen. The only thing about the, you know you want to get the view from above, and I didn't get that, so I was mad about that. But a few people shared their pictures, and the third was I was not to ride the camel. And, no camel uh, for you, Doctor J was like, I want to go to the camel. I said, Doctor J, you're not getting no. on that camel. But but my, but camels were not on my bucket list. I mean, <laughs> I just would be something to say, okay, I rode a camel, but it, and then and then you know I freaked all y'all out. Y'all were mad at me. Cause I got mad because I couldn't go up the hill for something, and so I found me a horse and buggy. I sit down. I sat you down, Dr. J. I sat you on on the Esplanade. You can look at the pyramid. Why? Why I do we have the pyramid? We blink and then we turn back. <laughs> and we're I like, know. how do we lose Dr. J? How, everyone's like, where's Dr. J? Where's? And I said, they were like Doriel. You were in charge of that. I was like, I know. I sat right there. And they said, nice people. You turn back and you're gone. I was like, I cannot go back home. I cannot go back home. Where's Dr. J? Where did you go, Dr. J? Up the hill. I know. In a horse and buggy with the, yeah. with a Lana and um somebody else. Um, I you know the, the, the we the, lost our elder. I was I was solicited by one of the Egyptian sisters. She said, "You want a horse and buggy ride?" It's how much? She said, 10 American dollars a piece." So I said, "Okay." So me and Lana and somebody else got jumped on there, and I'm like, "Okay, we got it." But then the phone starts blowing up. They're like, "Where are you? Where are you?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm, I'm way up the hill." They're like, "You have to come up back the hill in a horse and cart." Like, yeah. Go. And the horse and buggy was probably worse than the camel because it took a lot to get in and a lot to get out. Um, but I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. It was an amazing excursion. If people are saying, "Oh, you know, the, the all the little da, 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 you know, of, oh, you should be careful." And yes, you know, people should be careful. I will not take that away from anyone. But I will say what a brother said in one of our conversations. And again, thank you very much, Brother Taki, Sister Felicia, uh, Noha, Imad. If you know, you know who the, they are. We felt more protected there than a lot of us walking down our streets. 
that was incredible. That part. It was part of it was part of the economics of tourism, and I do understand that. But we everywhere we stepped, we had human shields around us, and it was amazing. So I say to anyone and everyone, when you were considering making your next travel off of US soil, put a couple of extra coins and go. Go. We had we had amazing people. We had brothers and sisters. Um, we had a couple from the UK. We yeah. had a couple from Ghana who flew in. We had uh, the sister, uh, sister Tanya Ruby from, uh, from well, it's just a Tanya from Mexico. We had Sister Tanya and and her daughter from Mexico, who I know are in here somewhere. I'm actually just looking for their names. Um, wait, wait, <laughs> wait. So moments with LJ. Hold on a second. Yes, that was too funny. They called the law. Child, we had to call the law. We had to call the law. Who remembers that? Did you did you see her? No, I didn't see her. She was on your watch, Dorel. I was like, I can't go. I can't go. I thought to check. It was it was hilarious. It was hilarious. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was very amazing that again, you know, again, 80 strangers from literally across the world coming together. And now we're in, you know, all of these sort of follow-up chats and we've developed amazing relationships and relationships. We looked after each other. We watched each other's back. And I mean, li literally and figuratively, it was beautiful. It was very beautiful again to have Dr. J who, who blessed us, uh, you know, with, with three, you know, gems of, of, of lecturers and lecturettes that are on my YouTube channel and you can go check them out there, but you have to subscribe to get them. And um, uh, Brother M. Fadishi Jehutimus, who was our, our, cultural guide and sage who uh now if you know and then we'll, we'll start to wrap up but i am going to bring up one question that's definitely for dr j um if you remember the movie black panther when uh the brother is standing in the museum and he's standing you know looking at the i think it was the mask and he asks the curator oh you know and she begins to tell him that this is so and so and then he goes now i don't know the whole script and he goes, well, no, actually, it's, you know, from this place. And she goes, no, it's not. And she goes to correct him. And then he sort of corrects her back. That was sort of like what happened on the trip. But Brother Fadisha Jehutimus, he was very, you know, careful and very, you know, stately. And so, of course, we're getting the information from the different tour guides and, and watching. And then as soon as they would sort of finish and shift, he would say, okay, no, actually, that's, you know, yeah, he was a wealth of knowledge. He was a, he was an absolute wealth of knowledge. And it, and you're it's so interesting that you raised that part in Black Panther because remember we were uh, they had a thing that looked like the Washington Monument. Uh, remember right, that, the obelisk? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, and it looked like the Washington Monument. And I'm like, the watch they ripped this off. You know, they ripped Egypt off by building this Washington Monument. But one of the biggest thing, one of the challenges I found. Is you know Shirley Graham Du Bois, who was the wife of W. B. Du Bois, used to always in her correspondence with Egypt is Africa, uh, because a lot of people don't think Egypt is Africa, and we found people there that we interacted with who I had to take my phone and pull a map of Africa and show it to this white man. Uh, we were at the, um, I think we we're at the fragrance place, and I don't know why, I don't know why random white people seem to think that they want to have conversations with me uh because it doesn't ever turn out right but they always seem like they want to, and so he we're just chatting and i'm polite and i'm interesting so we're just chatting and then he said well you know it's it's a good thing you came to to egypt and i said yes it's an african country i said i've been to several other african countries i started listing them you know Tanzania, kenya blah blah blah, blah. um and because my bucket list is to go to every african country and mm. anyway, so, and I've been about half, so we're on our way. But anyway, he said, but Egypt is not Africa. So I had to take my phone and show him the map. I said, now, where is this? He said, but it's not technically Africa. I said, well, what do you mean it's not technically Af It's on the African continent. What are you talking about? He says, it's an Arabic country. I said, Arabic country sitting in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was not atypical. I've talked to, I mean, I've been online and talked to people. And they just really, there's colorism in Egypt, uh, extreme colorism. If you notice those stores we went to, the the gold stop shop, the jewelry shop, right, the, the, jewelry. Uh, 
the, the fragrance place, the spice place. These weren't black people. Um, or the, but there were black people, they just weren't there. And so right, right. I found it really interesting and very I'm still wearing this uh little bracelet that the man gave me oh, at the bracelet. Yes. He gave it to me because I think it was about two in the morning one day and I was restless and none of my minders were around so I could sneak out the room and <laughs> Jesus. I'm telling you, we were trying to keep Dr. J on like under our finger. I don't want to say on lock. We try to keep her under our finger. Like, we I was just trying to watch out for you, and I really appreciate it. But <laughs> you know, um, Joyce La Joyce Ladner, my dear friend, and all of you know Dr. Joyce Ladner, who just lost her sister, uh, Dory Ladner, who was a real force in the civil rights movement. But Joyce, to this day, she met me when I was in my twenties, and to this day, she calls me the wild child. Um, and again, <laughs> let me let me let me just say, if y'all have not uh, heard Dr. J uh, on the um, on Roland Martin's show or some of the other commentary, th this diva here gives leaves no tea for the FEMA, right? Just be ready to have your mouth dropped that she's like talking and and or not talking that she's parlaying in the way that she does, which is just so beautiful to sit under. And literally and figuratively, I sat at her feet just in awe of the, the, the sage wisdom that I was being blessed with on numerous occasions. And it was very, it was just very heartwarming. It, it felt like I had images of and, and essences of my grandmother, of my great aunts, of aunts that I have, of, of the older women in my church. And that's what it felt like. And and I appreciate the sisterhood and the, the womanly uh, wellness that you bequeath to, to, to myself, to Tika, to, to Letta, um, looking at the to Tashi, to, to all the sisters who were, who were on that. And brothers as well, you know, of course, they were just like, wait, we got to get Dr. J up these stairs. We got to get Dr. J. And they were there, right? And, and oh, they, they were Jabed and Sean. I mean, those Jab brothers. Yes. They, and when we got back to JFK, you know, they helped um, help me get to the next, you know, because JFK is humongous, uh, to the next um, terminal to get back to D.C. Right. It was just amazing. I, I, I felt so very blessed and honored that, um, you know, I'm kind of growing into this elder role. I guess once you become mm -hmm. 70, you got to own it before I was like, but, but see, I can't wear I can't wear my whole heels no more. I was never a hoe. But I own whole heels. I own about 150 pairs of them that now have to leave my house because <laughs> I can't wear them and I don't want to be tempted. So, you know, but back in the day, I and I would run past with them heels. Um, you know, but back in that now I got to find some cute flats. Um cute flats. Cute flats. That's my fate. You oh know, my gosh. That is my fate. Cute flats. <laughs> Thank you. So I I want to I want to wrap up with this uh, very interesting question and thank you so much. I I do pray that Brother Dow K Roberts is still here with us. So this is actually a little HBCU uh, question slash commentary. I am going to pull it up. It may take a little space. So let me sit up to make sure it can be read. <laughs> okay. So the comment is HBCU economics. Robert Smith, Mackenzie Scott aside. Their investments in HBCUs are great. What's the true economic state of HBCUs? What can, should alumni, supporters, and companies do to help? Thank you in advance. So, Brother Daryl K. Roberts, thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, I will totally, that. yeah, I'll totally leave this to you because I will say I camel pride. I did not, uh, I was not able to attend an HBCU. I did attend a, a PWI, but some of the same answers that you're going to give for black alum of HBCUs, we at the PWI side, we got to do that and even much more because of our smaller numbers. But I will let you have the floor on this one. Yes, Dr. J. No, absolutely. No, HBCUs, are my, I didn't go to HBCUs either. I went to Boston College undergrad and MIT grad. And I tell people all the time, had I gone to an HBCU, I probably would have been a much nicer person because at PWIs, they make you, they assume you're dumb until you, they prove you're smart. Oh, at HBCUs, that part. At HBCUs, we assume you're smart until you prove you're dumb. Now, some of our students would prove that or they would. I had one girl, I had to tell her, her mom, I said, your daughter is using your money to buy a hotel room away from home because she don't go to class. She, all she does is 
lays up and runs over there to a and t to check out the brothers but that's neither here nor there um here's what's going on with hbcus first of all because of what's happening in education especially higher education you have people like rick de satan in florida um or in other in mississippi we, most of our hbcus are in the south and so we're having challenges because they're in the south as de, de satan has something anti-dei uh, what does that mean to HBCUs in Mississippi? They're trying to take and, and merge three colleges. Texas, Greg Abbott is a hater. And we could go down the list. So first of all, we're in a different climate than we were in a few years ago. Uh, President Obama didn't support us as much as I would have liked him to, but he did provide support. President Biden has tried and with uh, Howard um, alum Kamala Harris there. We're not going to get ignored, but there will be challenges, and there have been challenges. There's this white boy out of somewhere who is suing anybody who does anything black, like the Fearless Fund, which is black women who created a fund for black women entrepreneurs. They've been mm -hmm. sued. But they then take all that away, we're still in trouble. HBCU endowments, if you added them all up, they are not the size of Harvard's or even a smaller PWI. We don't give these, the endowments are low. We don't give. First of all, if you are an alum, you must give. You must give annually and you must give until it hurts. If you are not an alum, you must adopt an HBCU and give that, pick one, pick Bennett, that's mine, but, or pick Howard pick, and give to something that um, speaks to your values. For example, if the Hoppy family wanted to give a scholarship to a Bennett girl, to go on the tour. I would be over the total moon. Um, so you can give to at a university that somehow speaks your values. Give to the Department of African American Studies. Give, uh, yeah, St. Augs just lost their accreditation. More And, and Diane Bordley Suber, who was the president there when I was at Bennett, amazing woman. I know she's heartbroken, but we're all heartbroken whenever we lose an HBCU. Give to the HBCUs. And if you are retired or semi-retired, there are other ways to give. You can give your money, but I, I had at least three retired sisters who came to work for us. One basically came in, I won't say took over, but whipped my PR folks into shape. She was a, She had just retired from a Fortune 50. My folks had not done re-education and you know, they had been there forever. And she took them to school about PR. Um, I had another brother who basically came and taught, uh, his name is Luddy Hayden. He's in Greens. He retired to Greensboro, taught a global studies class. He was a retired, um, Shell oil executive. Um, and I had another sister who came and she just came and hung out with the girls, you know, with our HB, we, we just don't have the infrastructure, um, that we need. We don't have the dollars that we, I remember one of our boilers bursting. This was pitiful, Doriel. And I'm sitting at the steps of the president's house just crying my eyes out because I didn't know what to do. I mean, the boiler burst and the damn boiler, excuse my language, was so old, we had to send to like Europe or someplace to get the replacement part. Meanwhile, there was no heat in one of the dorms. And uh, 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 an ally, one of the white brothers on the board, he said, I'll put the girls up in hotels for two nights. Um, which wow. was just amazing because we could, I couldn't have them in the cold. They were freezing. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, we are dis And the reason why HBCUs are in such trouble is because of the history of racism, the history of where many states, if you're a state university, you weren't getting your share. If you were private, you also weren't getting your share. Now, in the last 15, 20 years, Spelman does very well. Morehouse does well. Uh, Tuskegee does well. You know, there are about five that do very well because they get the, um, I see someone say donate to Cheney. Absolutely. Uh, Cheney is a great, important college uh, that is under stress and it has to deal with the state of Pennsylvania and their legislature, which quite frankly, uh, let me just leave it at that. Y'all could, you heard me long enough. You can guess what I'm thinking and not say it. Uh, but in any case, please folks, if you believe, if you believe in, Black education, support our HBCUs. I'll tell one last thing as we're, I know we're winding down. I, that a month went by 
when somebody who had looked down on me when I first went to bed at some of my college, why would you go to an HBCU? You could be anywhere. Yeah, I could be, but I chose to be at Bennett. That same woman, sorority sister, about six months later called me. Her daughter had been put out of a PWI. Can you find some space for her at Bennett? And I had to do one of my breathing exercises. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, if I said, send me her transcript, I don't make those decisions my admissions department does. Well, actually, I did make a lot of decisions, but admissions was always mad at me because I would find some little sister by the side of the road, literally. And she said she wanted to go to college. I'm like, come on. And then they would say, what are we supposed to do with this? Because there are federal laws. I mean, you know, there are certain things you have to do, you know. But I let in a couple of young ladies who did not finish high school because guess, guess why? Neither did I. Um, I am a high school put out. Uh, I ain't drop out. They put me out. Uh, but both but, my parents. But that's a, so I, I have to say that that's a story in and of itself. Just to say, to know that there are options. Not just, no, let me make it clearer. Because some people feel if I don't go finish, I may not be able to get to that next room of higher education. If I have a marred high school uh, transcript because maybe now I went to Erasmus High School in Brooklyn. Shout out Brooklyn Flatbush. There were some of my colleagues and classmates who stood outside the gates. If you know Erasmus Hall, you know what I'm talking about on the Bedford or the Flatbush side. And some people said, oh, well, because I did that and I didn't finish in my time, I may not be able to, to hear that, yes, the president, the former president of Bennett College got put out. And look at her now. All, all grown I, up I did, I did graduate from college, magna cum laude. Uh, and some, some folks graduate, thank the Lord. Thank but, you. Uh, there, but but there, but you know, I went to I went to undergrad. I started undergrad in 1970. They were looking for Negroes. I mean, they were I, looking for us, and I right. had great scores. And right. I had great shout scores. out, right? Shout out to our, this, the your sister school down the road, Connecticut College. Shout out Camels, right? We down the road for each other, right? So yeah, the 69, 70, 71, 72. That that was where uh, hmm, the 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 colleges turned a leaf, turned over a new leaf. Well, now, since somebody's blown up my phone because I was supposed to do something with them at eight o'clock. Uh, so you got it. I, I, I am honored and delighted to have been with you. Happy family. I'm so family. happy that you are, <laughs> are on the call. And I look forward to our continued connections. Doriel, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. So um, let, let me just put this up. And so thank you, Dow K. Roberts. Your response was very much appreciated, especially about PR marketing, communications, which is lacking. Branding is key. You are welcome, Brother Dow. And Sister Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, so family, I appreciate you for being here, for staying, for uh, making comments. Uh, and my brothers and sisters from the, from the UK, uh, from South Africa. I appreciate you coming in. So continue to share this. Please stay tuned because we have more, more, more amazing people who will join us. And I wish you well. Dr. J, one second. So I will see you all on the next go round. This was Dr. Julia Malvo, the diva, the amazing, beautiful woman who is such a force to be reckoned with. And she came and and thought it not robbery to just chat with me. I thank you so much for allowing me to hold your hand and to get you up on the pyramid steps, but not up those big steps, right? <laughs> <laughs> Peace and blessings, everyone. Thank I will you see much, you sister. on we'll talk the next go Take care. Good day.